Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We will begin the week, as we most definitely do not mean to go on, with a rhyming couplet from one of our most dedicated correspondents, Seamus, responding to my little introduction to the programme before the news there. He writes, Mr Putin is kind of scary. He's a bit like you, James. Not too hairy. Thank you, Seamus. We were considering um, covering Prince William's haircut and, and wondering about man's strange relationship with his thinning pate. Um, we, we may reconsider that, actually, in the course of the morning. But I want to begin with matters military, the warning from the head of the army that we need more funds to cope with the Russian threat. <sighs> I thought, I thought the British politics was moving towards, the, and American politics, was moving towards a position that sort of posited Vladimir Putin as a good guy or someone we should admire, rather than necessarily somebody who we should fear being invaded by. And has Britain ever had the military capability to, to, to beat Russia? To resist an invasion, yes, actually, to answer my own question. But, but to, to march upon Moscow or... Stalingrad? Possibly not. I don't know. Five minutes after 10 is the time. Also on the list today, the school. I, you know when issues come around that, that could be construed as just an invitation to indulge in a little bit of lazy Muslim bashing, I tend to steer clear of them. But there's a danger in steering, clearing, steering, clearing, steering, clearing, in steering clear of them um, because they're being used to whip up so much negativity and unpleasantness by other people. And, and that is that you, you, you possibly don't shine enough clean light on issues that need clean light. I, I sort of loosely describe two kinds of light. There's dirty light and clean light. Dirty light would kind of be the kind of people who um, claim to be passionately concerned about women's rights issues or, 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 or child sex abuse when it's done by brown men, but they're incredibly silent when it's done by anybody else. Or indeed, when, when the... Um, President of the United States of America boasts about being a sex offender. They're cool with that, but if a brown bloke did, um, then it would be the end of civilization as we know it. So that's dirty light. I, I, I wonder sometimes whether the popularity and prevalence of dirty light in the British media at the moment prevents some of us from shining as much clean light on issues as we should. So I am going to talk today about a primary school that has reversed a ban on girls under eight wearing the hijab, the headscarf which seems to me to be pretty close to craven cowardice. But we shall explore further together in the course of the day. We begin with the army. And it's fair to say, there's two things I think I can say, one with certainty and one with confidence, but not certainty, because it would demand a, a, a knowledge of British military history, history that was as encyclopedic as it was ancient. Um, there's no way General Sir Nick Carter would have made this statement without um, a clearance in advance from the Secretary of State for Defence, newly installed Secretary of State for Defence, Gavin Williamson. So that, I'll say that with certainty. I'll say with confidence that you never ever get ahead of the army, suggesting that they could um, absorb a few cuts. You always, in fact, with most big departments, you, you'll very rarely find a, a head of the Met who thinks the Met's got too much money. In fact, I will, I'll say it with certainty, you never get this. You never get people in charge of law, large organisations, large publicly funded organisations, turning around and saying, we've got too much money. You may, you may find a couple of examples from history, but I think we can all agree the general truth is heads of armies never say they've got too much. They've always got too little. But that doesn't mean that they should be ignored. Um, something odd has happened in the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you've known, or maybe the last couple of months. Um, that narrative that was very popular from 2010 onwards, that the reason why we couldn't pay nurses... Uh, or, or, or soldiers, or police officers, or teachers, or firefighters, where they all had to have their pay frozen below inflation was because, well, clean light, it was because of the global financial crisis, dirty light, it was because of Labour's ludicrous overspending. Um, now that seems to have passed, I presume that the expiry date has been reached. Do you remember when we sat here in the good old days? when we talked about politics without fearing that we might be teetering upon the brink of some sort of apocalypse. We used to sit here and wonder, how long can they get away with this? It was the coalition government, chiefly. How long can they get away with claiming that, the, that this economic 
um, incompetence that we're describing is somehow a result of Gordon Brown's fiscal policies. How long are they going to claim that they can't spend money on mental health services for young people or, um, I, well, you name it. How long are they going to... And, and two things have happened to change this picture. The first is foreign aid has been elected by the newspaper editors as the new red herring with which to distract people from the reality of poor government. So anything that's underfunded... I, I presume today we're going to use foreign aid to boost the army, are we? Last week it was the police, week before that I think it was the NHS, week before that I think we were going to spend it on cold weather payments for old people. Week before that I think we were going to spend it, all the money we saved on foreign aid with buying everybody a Brexit unicorn. A for, the foreign aid budget, it's, it's amazing, it never goes away and it's always there. It's kind of replaced immigration as the thing that politicians and their friends on Fleet Street you can point at as, as the reason why all the, all the rubbish stuff that's going on, it's not the politicians' fault. Don't, don't blame them. Blame that bloke over there who's just opened a Polish shop. So that, that's a given, right? We can all agree on that. But that, that inflation of foreign aid has coincided with calls from within Theresa May's government for the Chancellor to spend more money on them. Seems to me to be now almost impossible for them to argue that there isn't enough money to spend on soldiers because of Gordon Brown. They can't really concede that George Osborne's policies of austerity have in many ways made that situation worse, although the Conservative Party is looking so fractured at the moment, I wouldn't actually bet against that happening in the next chapter or two. So they just have to pretend that there is enough money to go around. Presumably. Or or maybe there is. In which case, when can we see the lifting of the public sector pay cap? But we'll do what we always do on this programme, and we will confine our uh, attentions initially to people living the story rather than reporting it or commenting on it. I find the regime in Russia to be about as close to the definition of corrupt as it's possible to imagine in in the modern world. There are lots of other corrupt regimes on the planet. We seem to be living in an era where you can't criticise Vladimir Putin without somebody popping up and shouting, oh yeah, what about Robert Mugabe? Or, oh yeah, what about Catherine the Great? And, and I don't understand why. It's, it's as if, you know, if we were um, a football team, then somehow we'd be expected to play every other football team in the league at exactly the same time. Otherwise, you're discriminating and indulging in, in, in preferential prioritisation. We're playing Manchester United on Saturday, lads. Oh, yeah, what about Liverpool? Ha, oh, I can't deal with Liverpool, eh? Yeah, just play Manchester United, are you? And you sort of sit there sometimes and you go, what? What do you mean? So I, I think Vladimir Putin is a kleptocrat. I think he's presided over um, institutional theft of national... Um, uh, resources from the country that he governs on a scale that, that genu genuinely hasn't been seen before in, in recent history. And all of the evidence supports that position. There are lots of other bad people on the planet as well, but today we're talking about Russia. And the reason why we're talking about Russia is because it, it, it seems to me almost unbelievable that my country, our country, our home, has moved in the space of, what, five, ten years? from recognising Vladimir Putin's Russia as a, as a profound threat to world peace to um, somehow seeing it as, as something that we should admire. You get these strange people popping up in politics on both sides of the Atlantic, most obviously Donald Trump, who have never criticised him. Have you, have you Googled it? Have a check for me. Let me know if I've got that wrong. I, I, Donald Trump will criticise absolutely anybody. He'll criticise his own Department of Justice, criticise his own uh, former chief advisor, he'll criticise Secretary of State, he'll criticise um, law enforcement officers in America, but I don't think he's ever had a bad word to say about Vladimir Putin, which should, of course, terrify us, because it does rather suggest that Vladimir Putin might have something on Donald Trump. The scale of cyber warfare undertaken by the Russians is only now beginning to be understood and the impact that it had both on that election in America and on the Brexit referendum here will never be properly measured and it will never be fully understood. Trump's position and, and Brexit's success please Vladimir Putin because he likes instability in his historical enemies. The more unstable Europe can be, the more unstable America can be, the better it is for Russia for a whole heap of reasons, chiefly that you can't stand up and say to Russian dissidents, be more like us if we're a blinking mess. So that whole Arab Spring-flavoured uh, rejection of a status quo is never going to catch, it's never going to work. But we do have to recognise that not long ago, if the head of the British Army said we need more money because of the Russians, 
we'd have just said, where do we sign? Wouldn't we? Maybe not. I, I think we would. We just, well, well, all right, boss, where do we sign? All right, General, right you are. Yeah, those Russians, they really do wish us harm. Problem we've got in Britain at the moment is twofold. First is, significant sectors of our economy depend almost entirely on dirty Russian money. And the second is that there's been a sort of weird pro-Russian movement among sort of far right and, and, and similar personalities on our political landscape. Strange times. 10.15 is the time. If you're a soldier, a sailor, or a, um, an airman, an airwoman, then how, how, how worried are you? This works with teachers, and it works with police officers particularly well. It works with firefighters incredibly well. There are always some restrictions on what people can and can't say if they're still in service, but we have been incredibly lucky in recent months, years, to be able to conduct conversations about issues like this, chiefly with people who really do get it. It doesn't mean you're 100% right. You'll be able to find two members of the armed forces who disagree with each other on this. But as, as, a, as, a, as a punter, if you will, as an ordinary civilian, it frightens me a little bit. I presume it's supposed to, if the head of the army says that we can't keep up with Vladimir Putin's growing military set strength. I don't know where the next war will be fought, but unlike five years ago, I, I find the prospect of war believable now. I think five years ago we all thought it belonged to a different era, to a different species. So, just tell me, how bad is it? 0345 6060 is the number that you need. And, and you'll remember that we're probably going to lose some of the benefits of, of a common defence initiative with our European Union partners in the coming years as well. So, where does this stand? One little thing, just, just for the for the record, you know NATO, you know when we join NATO and, and, and abide by shared rules, do you know what that is? That, that's a loss of sovereignty. Right there, Brexit fans. It's impossible to um, abide by the rules of any supranational organisation, whether it's the World Trade Organisation, NATO, the European Union or the European Court of Justice, without sharing sovereignty. If we called it sharing sovereignty all along, we probably wouldn't have ended up in the mess that we're in, but by describing it as surrendering sovereignty, the whole picture changes. And some people say words aren't important. I, I hesitate to go for the old stock clock being right twice a day analogy, but it does work. Uh, heads of armies always complain that they haven't got enough kit and caboodle to do the job that they could have done a few years ago. But that doesn't mean that they're not telling the truth. Um, at least some of the time. I, I suppose they could be telling the truth all of the time. So when the head of the British Army warns that we can't keep up at the moment with Vladimir Putin's growing military strength, how do you respond? I, I, well, there's three lines of inquiry for me here. First, it would be service personnel past or present commenting upon the operational accuracy of this observation, 03456060973. The second uh, line of inquiry for me would be how do all of those people claiming that Russia is a, a, a shining beacon of strong government compute this new fact that the head of our army thinks that they're probably the gravest threat to us militarily currently on the planet. And number three, um, I suppose if you're an observer of world affairs, would you put anything past Putin? His, his sole real raison d'etre is to distract the Russian public from the amount of money he's stolen from them, and a foreign war is a brilliant way of doing that. 22 after 10 is the time. Dave's in West Molesley. Dave, what would you like to say? Hello, James. <coughs> Hello, mate. Hello. Hello, Hello Dave. Yeah, What's um, on your mind? Well, um, talking about um, Putin and Russia, um, I mean, back in the days when me and my wife served, late 70s, through to the 80s and that, it was the old Soviet Union. That was proper Cold so, War times, wasn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, we were always uh, training to, in re for a response to the Soviets if what, they what, came over. What, if they actually invaded Europe, continental Europe and Britain? Yeah, well, that's why you had, back then, I mean, um, I was in the late 70s, I joined, and then uh, I spent a lot of time in Germany and other European countries in the early 80s. But we, we were like 170,000 soldiers then. So our yeah. aim... And that, well, in the army alone, because it's, 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 yeah. it's less than half that number now. 
Yeah, I know. I've, well, I've noticed over the years. I mean, I, I always keep up because uh, my son is in the army as well. Um, so we've always kept up. But yes, uh, we had the troops, we had the kit. And all our aim in Germany at the time was to practice the Soviets coming over. So we'd have what was used to be called a crash out. So you'd be... And was that, was that, sorry to interrupt, and apologies if this is glib. Yeah, so so okay. if we were to say military enemy number one for, for all of your period of service, it would have been Russia, which is unsurprising given that we're talking about, a, 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 you know, a period that really did see relations between East and West reach breaking point. And then what was it after Russia? When, when sort of Yeltsin and Gorbachev softened that stance, what, what, what replaced Russia as our... Because that's why we've got... A, that's why we've got 80,000 odd soldiers today yeah. instead of 170,000, isn't it? Because we felt that that threat had yeah. gone away. I mean, um, the, so the Russian issue has always been there, even in the 90s, before they started reducing the troops in Germany and whatnot. But, yeah, the late 70s and the 80s for me, it was the Soviets. Um, the only other sort of main issue we had was um, Ireland. Oh, and yeah, of course. Then, then the Falklands came along in 82, so we had that as a sort of take your mind off things. Um, we didn't really have much else. Um, say Germany... We so you can't, you can't criticise the powers that be for, for, for reducing the size of the force then, really, unless we somehow cast Russia as always having been a threat, we just didn't notice. So when you see a story no, like this, and I, I, I won't keep for much longer, but when you see a story like this, how, how do you know when it's real, and how do you know when it's just another head of the army asking for more money from government? I think, uh, I, well, I, when my son left recently, um, he left because of the cutbacks. He was he spent four years in Germany, um, and he, he said you could tell there, there wasn't a lot of money around. That there wasn't so much, you know, the kit was, wasn't always up to date. Promotion was poor, com you know, things like that. So. He left, and he's now a policeman, but... Blimey, out of uh, the frying pan into the fire, Dave. Well, yeah, that was all he... He always wanted to do that, so he was going to go in the army first anyway, a bit of life experience, and then become a copper. There's Lewis the other story, the other contender for our 10 o'clock topic was the burglary increase by 20% in 12 months, according to the Met figures, and a lot of that's blamed on cuts as well. So I, that's all I mean with my slightly facetious yeah, yeah. fire and frying pan observation. So, I, I, OK, so I, I guess what we don't know is what sort of threat Russia poses, you and I? We don't know that. Well, I suspect that over the years, since we've reduced our numbers, um, back in my day, we had all the, we had the troops, we had the kit. We used to practice a lot um, in Germany. Um, we used to deploy to a unit I was at. We used to deploy as far up north as Norway and as far um, sort of east as east, eastern Turkey because... Back then, Georgia and that was used to be the the Russians. That's right. So we were we were close to the Russian border in eastern Turkey. So we deploy to places like that to practice in the cold and the, the the heat in case they did. And what? And in Germany, they would come straight through the middle because back then it was still eastern Germany by the Russians and you know uh, and as far back and, and sometimes parts of Poland. So. That was an ideal place to come through. So they, they had to have that many troops in Germany to counter any supposed threat. Um, but the training always involved from good intel. So we knew that like Russian pilots, because they didn't get paid very well, they would, they would drink the um, fluid that used to clear the windscreens on jets. Little stupid things like that, or they would sell... Some of the stories from from the from the Afghanistan invasion actually were, uh, uh, were, were chilling. I mean, it is a, it's an odd, impenetrable world, uh, Russia, and, and for most of well, for all of my adult life, it has been. And it's people like you that sort of get a glimpse of what life is like for your opposite numbers. Um, but the rest of us are often left to rely upon second-hand reports, which is why I find stories like the one today so troubling. Should should I, I don't like doing phone-ins based on should we be scared, but. If Vladimir Putin is prepared to put Donald Trump in the White House and disrupt any form of, of Western democracy solely to sow instability, and if we have now what I, I suppose you'd have to describe as, as sort, of, sort of quislings and fellow travellers in our public sphere who speak up for Vladimir Putin, they've got their own television station that 
you know, uh, British politicians and pundits who really should know better routinely pop up on a, on a television station funded by the Kremlin to challenge the, the narrative of proper news, objective news, that are still a little bit off left in this country. So if they're prepared to put that sort of effort into disrupting the West, I, 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 I'm not going to dismiss this general's warnings with, um, with any confidence whatsoever. Peter is in Birmingham. Peter, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello, Thanks mate. for having me on. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I, I'm currently serving in the Air Force and have been um, since 2003, so I've kind of seen um, the modern era um, change for the military. And uh, it is true what you're saying, that the military needs more money and that any Army, Air Force or Navy chief's always going to ask for more money. Yes. So how, do, how, does, some, how, does, a, how does a how does a geezer on Civvy Street know when it's really important and when it isn't? Well... <laughs> To be honest, they they won't. They and th there's an element of trust that you've got to have in both our politicians and, and chiefs to sort of strike the right balance. But I think the using the Russians as the excuse for needing more money, yes. I think, is a bit of a red herring. Oh, okay. And and the, and the reason is, I, I think that's been true for the last decade. Um, I think even if we went back ten years ago, we would have needed more money to to fight off the Russians. But I think what has changed is the excuses to try and raise that more um, that money. So 10 years ago, we'd have been using, we need money to save lives in Iraq or Afghanistan. Well, actually now the modern threat is is Russia um, or is a global threat maybe from, from North Korea. So I, I, I'm a bit more maybe sceptical that all of a sudden in the last six months, something's changed dramatically that we need this. But um, unfortunately, if the Russians decided that they wanted to attack us, there's nothing really we could probably do about it. Um, and they'd I mean, start by cutting small. undersea web cables, apparently, which would kind of uh, put us yeah, back in I, the dark ages. I, I think, yeah, and I think the sort of the way the Western um, democracies rely on computers and, and our whole sharing, um, union, country, that kind of thing. Our, yeah, the, you could bring, you could crumble our country, or probably overnight, if you really attacked the internet the computers, brought down all the banking services and all of that. And there might not be any loss of life, but you'd absolutely cripple the country um, quite quickly. And, and then that, that is what modern modern warfare looks like. And, and well, you say it'd be a wake-up call, arguably. It could be It could be too late by then. Um, I wonder whether Brexit's going to make us look like that hobbled gazelle at the back of the pack for, for, for Russia, because all of the things that Nick just said, of course, we'd be stronger resisting um, in union, in numbers. I still get confused about that European Union army being held up as a terrible, terrible bogeyman. Because, I, I mean, I, I don't have a degree in history. I've only got an A-level. But I'm pretty sure that the armies Britain has really had big problems with over the years, and not the armies that we've been in. Some breaking news for you. Um, you may want to sit down for this. Someone called Princess Eugenie has got engaged to a bloke called Jack. In other news, I won two bottles of scotch and a bottle of Merlot at the church raffle yesterday, which I am not claiming provides an insight into what God thinks about dry January. I'm, I'm merely, I'm merely relating the facts. The facts of the story that's under discussion this morning are, um, it's just an amusing tweet trying to compare descriptions of the threat posed by Russia to um, pre-Iraq war descriptions of, of weapons of mass destruction. Um, the CIA, of course, warned that the reports detailing the uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, manufacturing of weapons of mass destruction couldn't be trusted. George W. Bush elected to ignore them. I suppose if you want, you, you, you could claim that the Russian army doesn't have 270,000 people in it, 2,700 tanks, over 1,500 surface-to-air missiles, 1,000 special forces. Navy's got 150,000 people in it, 62 submarines. We've got seven at the moment, by the way. Um, you, I, I suppose you could claim that, but if you are, you're listening to the wrong radio programme, seriously. Plenty of places in the British media where you can stick your fingers in your ears and close your eyes and whistle wibble until close of play. This just ain't one of them. 10.37 is the time. So, how does a ordinary Joe like me know, A, whether or not warnings that our army is underfunded are just the same as all those other warnings, and B, how realistic a threat Russia poses to Britain? C, I suppose, you have to mention Trident. Um, and that increasing sense that if someone throws a nuclear... Also, nuclear bombs, nuclear missiles, cost us an absolute fortune. But do they really work? I don't know. Maybe that's for a different day. I've got a couple of phone lines free, and I don't have any female voices. I hate it when men dominate these... Uh 
these issues. 03456060973. is the time. Nick is in Wandsworth. Nick, what would you like to say? Yeah, good morning, James. Hello, man. Um, I'd like to say pretty much that the Russian threat, I don't think, has ever gone away. Um, they've always been very strong, is an understatement. Um, like you've just brought up about Trident, the one thing that keeps us um, safe, if, if safe is the right word, is the fact that we do have a nuclear deterrent. Now, I've sat around with mates of mine, you know, having a few beers, talking about this on more than one occasion. And the way we would do it... Uh, are, are, you so, are you ex, ex, ex forces? Yeah, yeah. Good, because yeah, I, yeah, I, I yeah, was yeah, about yeah. to I'm say, sorry. what do you lot know? You're all plummers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, plumbers. So me, I was sitting around plumbers. with my mates sorting out Kidder Mr. Harry's back line, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're qualified to comment on him. <laughs> uh, <exactly. laughs> so carry on. Oh, I, I, spent, uh, I spent 18 years in a, in a, in a frontline combat unit. There I, you go. <laughs> uh, in, uh, yeah, sorry, I was in Germany, in BAOR and all that sort of stuff, so yes. pretty much like the first call, though. Yes. I was in a main battle tank regiment, so we knew what we were up against you know we were sort of 10 to 1 then yes so now we've only got two regiments the challenger left um, we are struggling um, no matter how we look at it and without even sort of trying to polish it a little bit although we are the best forces in the world and we are the best trained we haven't gone up um, if Russia decided that they wanted to uh, move into this country without it say I'll just say for a minute that we haven't got nuclear deterrent okay so just imagine that we didn't have that yeah my, the way we would do it, and me and my pals have sat around and discussed it, is we would move a bridgehead into Gatwick Airport and one into Manchester. I want to come to the pub with you. Law I want to come away. to the pub with you. Mate, you should come. I totally, It'd be a laugh. I totally want to come. This, I, this, this is just brilliant. This is, I mean, talk about getting bored of Brexit. You're, 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 you're actually preparing for World War Three when you're having a pint. Well, it's, it, you know, it's not... Stop it's it. Not I, I, I interrupted you. So we're going to get a bridgehead at Gatwick. Yeah. Carry on. So, well, we get a bridge at the Gatwick, we get one at, at Manchester Airport as well, which are two fairly decent hubs to move your forces into, and this is where you need to base all your logistics. And pretty much, I'd put the country under under martial law from, from pretty much day one. I reckon we've probably got enough air power to last about eight, nine hours, and our, our you know, our ground forces would probably have to surrender or, or be annihilated. But would That's they be able to get, wouldn't they have to conquer all of Europe before they could invade Britain? No, because oh. Europe pretty much is... They've got enough forces that the Russians put a big emphasis on airborne. So everything that they have in their airborne divisions is portable. So they chuck it on the back of these great big carriers that they've got, they fly them in, and they can get a, they can get a brigade into a place within probably two to three hours. I'm going off you now, Nick. I'm, not, I'm going to be honest. I thought mate. you might. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's just so we'd, we'd be toast eight to eight or nine to eight or nine hours of of air, air resistance. We've got yeah thirty thousand people in the in the RAF. We've got one hundred and thirty seven typhoons, fourteen lightnings, yeah. sixty two tornadoes. The yeah. Russians have got one hundred and sixty five thousand bodies, two hundred and ten fighter jets, two hundred and ninety five ground attack jets. That doesn't include bombers, does it? Or no. Uh, because the then last the week, are... last week, RAF jets were scrambled to see off Russian bombers heading for UK airspace, while the number of Russian submarines close to British waters is at its highest since the Cold War. Yeah, so to answer your initial question as as Joe Public, if you like, as yeah. you, someone who, who doesn't really know a great deal about it, which is fair enough, it's not your line, you know. No. It's what I spent 18 years of my life preparing for and being trained for, pretty much. And I can tell you now, they're very capable. Oh, and they're Lord. barbaric, and they're very resourceful, they're very tough, and they're very well-trained. They're not, you know, like this conscript army that we keep kidding ourselves they are. I don't think we do that I'm anymore. I, I mentioned Afghanistan no. earlier, which I think does fit the model no. of, a, of a conscript army, but this is this is yeah. a very different Russia, and um, well, what about Putin's ex-KGB, of course. Yeah, what about Chechnya? What yeah. about Crimea? Crimea looks like he, it could be a test was, run. He was literally flicking his little finger when he was playing about with that. Of course he was. He, he was waiting to see whether NATO Russia. would grow any. Let's see. And what we did, we put some troops on. Uh, we put some troops on exercise in Poland. There's some of my pals that have been out there, and uh, I've obviously got mates that are still serving and all that. And they they've been out there, and you know they're bothered. Really? We, we haven't got the logistic. We haven't got the logistical well, line. Okay, we don't, don't go. I'm going to stay with this for a bit longer, I think, because we're getting the calls okay. that I, I crossed my fingers we'd get. There's 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 something you might not be aware of underpinning what you're saying to me. 
Okay. Which is that what we've currently got now is barely better than nothing. Well, that's exactly what it is. All it is, it's the bare minimum to keep everyone happy. That's all we've got. We've got a lot of people in the country in political positions that, you know, would that they run our armed forces even further down because they, they just don't see that they're required until an emergency comes. And they say, all oh, right, hurry up. We've got to get some conscripts in. Uh, what about national call-up again? Um, how long is that going to take? And by the time we thought about that and put the, uh, the you know put it through the House of Parliament, we've already got Russian tanks on the streets of London. I um, me. I, I, I hear you. Obviously, I, I'm still up for that pint. Yeah. Although I'm, I might I might need a chaser <laughs> now that I've had a, full, <laughs> <laughs> a proper insight into where these ruminations lead you and your former comrades. But the but the but the, but the other point to make, and this is sort of in defence of what you feel to have been a, a, a decades long process of dilution and diminishment. As a 46-year-old man, with the exception of the Falklands, which obviously felt like it was on the other side of the world, even though it was categorically a, a defence of British people, I don't know, listening to you, whether I've ever clocked the British Army as an agent of defence rather than a, an agent of offence. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I totally see what you mean, but those conflicts we were talking about were tiny. Yeah. Tiny. But it's not Peaceful. since 1945 that we've actually seen our country as something that might need to be defended from a foreign foe, is it? Or, well, I suppose the depths of the Cold War. Well, in the depths of the Cold War, if you look at the start of the Second World War, we were massively under underprepared for that. Mm. We sent the British Expeditionary Force to France with barely what they stood up in and expected it all to be over by Christmas. Well, you're a cheery soul, Nick. Sorry, mate. That's all right. It's ten forty-five on a Monday morning. I see you've gone all the way now. Seriously, but I am genuinely, as you know, properly grateful to you because I always find these conversations. Maybe it's just. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm happy to be wrong, but I, I just do think that when we don't sort of bombard the the the, the, the defence correspondents and the self-appointed experts and the politicians and the ex this and the ex that, and we we focus instead upon people who listen to this program with a personal interest in the issues, they can often shine a little bit of light that the rest of us ordinarily can't find. Nick, I think we can all agree, just proved it. 10.45. And um, that sort of growing sense that we've been obsessing about all the wrong things in this country for the last couple of years assumes a rather more urgent flavour when I, I read you something that was said um, in an interview of the uh, b b the Berlin Security Conference in a, a couple of months ago. We see a considerable increase in the risk of a major interstate conflict. This is General Denis Mercier, the NATO Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, um, speaking to Reuters a couple of months ago, um, because every four years they publish a report examining military threat, military strength and, and sort of global trends, NATO do, of which of course we're a member, and the latest report p p pinpointed China's growing military strength and a resurgent Russia as posing growing challenges to the transatlantic alliance in coming years. Um, NATO's moves to bolster its capabilities could, could trigger a new Cold War-style arms race. If you sometimes doubt the truth of, of reports re regarding Russia's involvement in Western matters, just dig out. I wish, I wish we could have kept it here. When um, Ukraine kicked off, the number of people who'd bought the Russian line, the number of people ringing me, on a London radio station, before Twitter got invaded by people who were obviously bots sitting in a basin in, 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 in Volgograd, the, the number of people who rang in to say, well, you can't, can't blame the Russians. They've got NATO parked on their doorstep. Uh, the European Union, Ukraine wants to join the European Union. You can't blame the Russians. And you, you sort of found yourself thinking, crikey, it's almost like Rocky Three never happened. The, the, this historical polarity between America and Russia, between the West and the East, does genuinely, to me, seem to have been diluted by cyber warfare and by propaganda. It's Russia today, and I'm a great believer in the freedom of the media, but Russia today operate with impunity on these islands. And yet Russian journalists in Russia don't enjoy the freedom that Russian journalists here spread, like journalists loosely. Pro Russian propagandists in Britain enjoy more freedom than genuine Russian journalists in Russia, let alone British or American journalists. And yet we've got people cheering it on. We've got people in Britain describing Vladimir Putin as someone to be admired. <sighs> so when a story like this comes along, I, I presume they scurry for the, for the shadows. 10.52 is the time. Gus is in Hampstead. Gus, what can you tell us? 
Hey, John. Hey, James. How oh, you doing? All good, mate. So, well, I'm a little bit worried, actually, but, you know, it was a figure. Well, and you should be. <laughs> and, and, you should, and you should be. So, my background, I was in the Royal Air Force 1979 through to the end of the Cold War. Uh, I left because, you know, I foolishly believed that peace had broken out. Exactly. Well, not foolishly. You can forgivably, I'm going to go with, mate. Don't beat yourself up. You forgivably believed. So, you know, um, when we look at it now, the same things now are happening. And they've always been happening. Don't don't fool ourselves by thinking that they went away. You know, the Russians are testing our defences. They always have done. Uh, I was operationally on QRA, which is a quick reaction. To these, these are the jets that fly up and intercept the Russian interlopers yeah. uh, and persuade them to move away. Um, so we practice for a dogma of a 72-hour war back in the Cold War. Uh, it, that 72 hours after it kicked off, it would be over pretty much. Uh, that would be the speed at which things were expected to happen. Now, frankly, I think it would be over in a day. Um, you have an armed force that, frankly, would have trouble filling a large portion of Wembley Stadium if you got them all together. You know, And I think that's something people need to realise, that visualise the total number of, of people that we have in our military. Uh, and it's a portion, it's, it's 50 to 60 percent of Wembley Stadium, that's it. That's what we have protecting you, me and everybody else. Well, if I add up all the personnel in the RAF, the Army and the Navy, it's closer to, to 150,000. I'm not, I'm not really faulting your, your reasoning, but the number doesn't, the Wembley analogy doesn't quite work. Well, it, it's, it's a trivial amount, right? It's, yeah. it's a trivial amount. Unless we're talking about immigration, of course, in which case 150,000 people is the biggest number you've ever heard. <laughs> See, you had to stay with that. Right? You had to Always, get mate. one you know me. in there on you it. Know you know me. <laughs> so, um, so I think that you know, we, we, it's something that we need to take seriously. You know, if you wonder why uh, Syria, uh, in, in Syria, for example, why is Russia in Syria? Yeah. It's not there because they, they care about Assad. It's not there. They're not there because power. They're there because they want access to a deep water port in the Mediterranean. That's the whole reason that Russia is active in Syria right now. They have no motivation apart from some something that they, they want. And, I, and as close as I can figure it, they need access to a deep water port in the Mediterranean. They don't have one right now. And the, the, I mentioned this to Richard. I just need to issue an apology. I, I don't know what it says about the listenership to this programme, but I've had more people saying to me, it's Rocky 4, not 3. Um, <laughs> <laughs> than I have anyone contributing to the more substantive issues thrown up by the program. I've got to say, that Russian did have a hideous haircut. He did. I should have gone for Top Gun. It's like they've never seen Top Gun. Is that better? Oh, no, we're remaking Top Gun. So oh, there we go. I mean, re remaking Top Gun. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, here's the thing, right? And I hope this comes out right. In the great scheme of things, it doesn't really matter whether it takes three days or one day, does it? Or were you suggesting that if it, in the three-day model we might have won? Well, indeed, it would. It was expected to be close. You know, um, there oh, are I good see. things about our military. There are bad things about theirs. You know, but, you know the seventy-two-hour doctrine would be that we would stand a reasonable chance of winning. Um, okay. And uh, you know, right now, in twenty-four hours, I think you know we'd be inviting them in. For but tea. wouldn't wouldn't we be <laughs> wouldn't we be um, tea and polonium? Wouldn't we be? Uh, aided by our NATO allies. I mean, invasion of a NATO country is, is an invasion of NATO. It's, it's, I know. So it, takes, Go on. It, it takes time to deploy, right? So, back in the Cold War, you know, we had forces in station. So, for example, we had several RAF squadrons based out in Germany, all the way up the border uh, with East Germany uh, and into Holland. Uh, we had US forces deployed here in the UK. We don't have any of that deployment right now. So for NATO to be effective, it has to be on station to execute its role. And right now, NATO is not on station to execute its role. And, and also, it's since it's NATO's inception, we've had a, a, a United States president who considers his role to involve leading the world, uh, militarily leading the Western world, leading NATO. And, and we don't have that at the moment. We've got someone who complains about how much it costs. Absolutely. If the Russians sent us an invitation saying, look, we'd like to have a war in about six months, is that okay with you? We might be uh, okay. We say, you know what, maybe we'll be okay. We'll get some people in place and we'll have a good party. It'll be fine. Do you know any jokes? Do I know any jokes? Yeah, I just feel that we've cast something of a shadow yeah, over, sure. over all the people listening today. Uh, well... I don't want to hear an ex-soldier's joke on my radio programme at 3 minutes to 11 in the morning. I'm just going to go I'm going to park that tank right here. David is in Evesham in Worcestershire. David, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Uh, good to speak to you again. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the problem that we have in the military is that there's only so much crystal ball gazing you can do. Mm. So we only ever really look at and fund and, and design an army based upon what we're fighting at the time. Yes. 
so a few years ago when it was decided that we were going to cut the army to 74,000 and then have 30 odd thousand reserves and the army would be light and fast and all of our heavy armor would be put into storage and mothballed um and we would have really light fast uh, maneuverable vehicles and we would have light battalions who could be moved at a minute's notice by aircraft anywhere in the world that's how it was all designed because that was the war that we were fighting at the time which was afghanistan um we didn't really have any heavy armor over there um as such and it was decided uh, that, that we would go light the person that presided over all of these decisions in his former job mm. about three four years ago was General Sir Nick Carter. Okay. So he designed the army as it sits today. But would he not he would he not describe that as cutting his cloth? He, he wasn't in charge of setting the budgets, he was merely in charge of deploying them. Yeah, but that's how he, he designed the army in that particular way. So he made the decision that and advised ministers that this is how the army should look. We should be light and fast and let's get rid of heavy armour which is what the Russians are really good at. Yes. Um, oh, OK, so, so he's got some questions to answer himself. That. Absolutely. In your view. But, but the, the, key, the key thing for me is, if the person who has cut and has been in charge of designing the army to look like it currently is, yeah. now turning around and saying, actually, well, yeah, we need, we need more funding and we can't afford to cut the military anymore, if he's turning around, effectively he's saying, I was wrong. And, and also... Um, the threat of terrorism, which has been focusing our minds a lot recently, has um, uh, arguably been superseded by the threat, his uh, long-term threats posed by the resurgence of Russia and the, and the growth of China. David, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but do you think if you see cyber warfare as warfare, in many ways we're already at war with Russia, but we're just not fighting back? Yeah, it's just a different form of warfare. Oh, Lord above. I was hoping you'd either laugh at me, tell me to shut up, or kind of contradict me. Um, just as a sort of brief postscript to that latest resignation from the artists formerly known as UKIP, um, the, the, the chap who describes himself as William Dartmouth is, of course, William Legg, the 10th Earl of Dartmouth, another doughty enemy of elites everywhere. Um, yeah, you only become an elite when, when you're up to the 12th or 13th iteration of the earldom. Uh, if you're only the 10th earl, then you really are a, a, you know, a, a, a horny-handed son of the soil, sticking out for, for ordinary people. I have to miss time, time.